good day and welcome to this Tiffany & Company third quarter 2018 conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. Participating on today's call is Mr. Mark Aaron, Vice President of Investor Relations, Mr. Alessandro Boliolo, Tiffany's Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Mark Erseg, Tiffany's Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. And at this time, I would like to turn the call over to Mr. Mark Aaron. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's call. I hope you have all had a chance to review the news release we issued earlier today. Alessandro and Mark have some brief comments to share with you, and then we will be pleased to take your questions. Before continuing, please note that statements made on this call that are not historical facts are forward-looking statements. Actual results might differ materially from the planned, assumed, or expected results expressed in or implied by these forward-looking statements. The company undertakes no obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements to reflect subsequent events or circumstances, except as required by applicable law or regulation. Additional information concerning factors, risks, and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially as well as the required reconciliations of the non-GAAP measures referenced in this presentation to their comparable GAAP measures is set forth in Tiffany's Form 10-Q filed earlier today with the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as the news release filed today under cover of Form 8-K. Those filings can be found on Tiffany's investor website, www.investor.tiffany.com, by selecting financial information in the left-hand column. I'm now pleased to turn the call over to Alessandro. Thanks, Mark, and uh, hello, everyone. The details of our financial results uh, are contained in today's news release uh, and uh, thank you filing, so we decided to abbreviate our formal comments in order to have more time to answer your questions. But before taking any question, I want to spend a few minutes commenting on some highlights of those results and uh, their relevance to our long-term strategies. Mark Kersig will then address the financial results and the outlook. I joined Tiffany a little more than one year ago, and uh, I cannot be more pleased with and uh, appreciative uh, of what our team has accomplished uh, in a short time. Worldwide net sales have increased uh, 10% in the year to date with balanced performance throughout the business. We have modernized our marketing communication, have accelerated new product innovations, and uh, have enhanced uh, our store base. I previously said that we are on a long and exciting journey, and I'm pleased to report that we have had uh, a good start. Earlier this year, we laid out our six key strategic priorities and also said that we would be increasing investment spending in several areas in order to support uh, sustainable sales growth. Despite uh, some external factors that have mitigated the portion of our recent sales growth and uh, related uh, near-term uh, uncertainties, I am uh, encouraged and uh, as confident as ever about the long-term path that we are on. Communicating brand relevance and desirability begins at home to local customers in the Americas, Asia-Pacific, Japan, and Europe. In this objective, we are making good progress. We have increased the sales uh, attributed to local customers in each of the first three quarters of the year and in all regions. Such gains were partly offset in the third quarter in some markets by lower sales uh, attributed to foreign tourists particularly to Chinese. Of course, uh, tourist sales for Tiffany and the overall industry can be volatile due to currency shifts, regulations, travel patterns, and uh, other factors. In the third quarter, sales attributed to Chinese tourists were lower in the Americas and in Hong Kong, as were wholesale sales to Korean duty-free operators related to Chinese tourist purchases which had been very strong for several quarters. But on the contrary, we have achieved a healthy double-digit sales growth in mainland China throughout the year, 
with even stronger momentum in local currency in the third quarter. We can speculate on the reasons for the fury spending slowdown outside of China, but the reality is that the Tiffany brand is appealing to Chinese customers, as evidenced by the continued strong sales growth in mainland China in the quarter. Another objective is to achieve increased jewelry unit volume, and I'm pleased that overall jewelry unit volume has increased in all three quarters of the year. Consistent with this product innovation that is more frequent and distinctive is one of our priorities, and we have been exciting customers this year with the launches of the Paper Flowers and Tiffany True Collections, as well as making additions to existing jewelry collections such as Tiffany T, Tiffany Keys, Hardware, and Return to Tiffany. In fact, in September, we celebrated the launch of Paper Flowers in Shanghai with a major event attended by hundreds of customers, celebrities, and influencers. The resonance across digital and traditional media all over China has been uh, spectacular. As we disclosed three months ago, we are also investing more in our hydro assortment, which we believe offers meaningful long-term opportunities in key global markets. In October, we held our annual Blue Book event in New York for select customers who reacted enthusiastically to the extraordinary creations and do the enhanced high jewelry offering that we presented. We were very pleased with sales results. Introducing new products and communicating an inclusive and culturally relevant message are intended to increase store and online traffic and conversion rate. Both metrics have increased in the quarter and year to date. We are pleased with customer reaction to our Make It My Tiffany program to personalize pieces of jewelry. And uh, we recently launched a powerful holiday marketing campaign of which I hope you have watched the whimsical video on YouTube or our social platforms. Another strategic point is to invest in digital and omnichannel, and we are seeing the benefit. Our website serves uh, as a powerful marketing vehicle to further enhance brand and product awareness. And online shopping has been increasing. In fact, we have been very pleased with double-digit e-commerce sales growth in the quarter and year to date. To improve the in-store experience, our sales professionals are engaging with customers in a more consultative way, and we are increasingly seeing the benefit from utilizing our global CRM system capabilities. We are also addressing the look and feel of the stores with visual merchandising enhancements in our North American stores this year, and we'll do so in all stores globally next year. In closing, our third quarter results came in close to our expectations. We are certainly mindful of external uncontrollable factors but will not be distracted by them. So I believe that we are taking the right steps on this long and exciting journey. I will now turn the call over to Mark Ursic. Thanks, Alex. Reported sales grew 4% during the third quarter, and as predicted, earnings per share came in slightly below a year ago at 77 cents per share. As an increase in gross margin and a lower than expected tax rate on the quarter, was offset by a substantial increase in SG&A-related investment spending, as well as an unexpected charge of $0.05 cents per share for the estimated net loss from the recent bankruptcy filing of a precious metals refiner. Net inventories were 6% above prior year as we built stock in anticipation of the holiday season and made incremental investments in our high jewelry assortment, which was, in part and as Alex already mentioned, responsible for a very strong Blue Book event this past October. With total debt representing only 31% of stockholders' equity and $655 million of cash and cash equivalents on hand at quarter end, our balance sheet remains strong. As we have clearly and repeatedly communicated, we are increasing strategic investment spending this year across a number of areas and intend to maintain these higher levels of support going forward in order to drive sustainable top-line sales growth, margin expansion, 
and higher asset productivity. One of those areas is information systems, where we're happy to report that seven additional countries were placed onto our new IT platform during the third quarter. These countries are in addition to China, which was converted during the first quarter of this year. You will recall that this suite of IT tools enables a common order and inventory management system, a single financial instance, and for the first time, a source to pay procurement system. The multifunctional teams responsible for these efforts are working very hard and we remain pleased with the progress being made to improve our systems and processes as part of this multi-year modernization effort. In terms of our financial outlook for the year, we continue to expect high single-digit sales growth and diluted earnings per share of $4.65 to $4.80 per share. We expect our tax rate to be in the low to mid-20s, share of purchases of approximately $400 million, and we expect to generate nearly $300 million of free cash flow. Finally, as is our normal practice, we will provide a holiday sales update in January and comment on our initial financial guidance for 2019 when we report our full year results in March. I'll now turn the call back to Mark. Thanks, Alessandro and Mark. Uh, operator, I think we're ready to take some questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach the equipment. Again, that is star one for questions. We'll go first to Paula Juez at City Research. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, can you talk about the pricing actions you took in, in China? When were prices lowered and on what percentage of the assortment? And curious what the response has been and whether or not you think that uh, might have contributed to strength on the mainland, maybe a little bit of a weaker uh, Chinese tourist business. Thanks. Yeah, I think what we would tell you is that we did uh, make some pricing adjustments in China. Um, the first one was in July. That was in response to the change in tariffs. Um, we talked about that during our last call and felt that it was important for us to uh, be mindful of what was happening in that marketplace. And so we did uh, you know, pass through, in effect, the full value of that tariff slash duty uh, reduction. Now, subsequent to that, we have continued to look at our global pricing, as we always do, um, and we have made some adjustments uh, since that point in time uh, to our global pricing strategies, uh, which went into effect, you know, towards the very later stages of the month of August, and China was uh, part of that. And, and how did the consumer respond there? Uh, so far, as uh, Alex indicated, we've been doing exceedingly well with mainland Chinese. Uh, our domestic business there was very strong for the first two quarters of the year, and it's only accelerated into the third. Is that unit-driven or is that ticket-driven, Mark? Both. 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 Okay, great. Thanks, guys. We'll go next to Omar Syed at Evercore ISI. Thanks for all the information this morning. Good morning. Um, could you talk about, you know, if you saw in the quarter or in the weeks leading up to the quarter and since, uh, if you're willing to comment, the, you know, the financial market volatility, are you seeing that, uh, you know, because especially in Asia, having an effect on the customer base, or do you see customer behavior that's still really separated from what we're seeing in the financial markets? I know there's a lot of concern out there that financial market volatility, you know, eventually start to weigh on consumers' minds, especially the luxury consumer. Any thoughts you have around that would be really appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Omar, uh, for your question. What we have uh, clearly seen uh, in, uh, in the quarter has been uh, a shift in, uh, in Chinese uh, tourism and, uh, and spending. So we have seen uh, spending of Chinese tourists going uh, down in important markets outside of China, and we have seen uh, strong sales in mainland China. Our sales in mainland China were actually double digit in the first two quarters, and they even accelerated in local currency in the third quarter. So uh, this is the clear pattern that we have seen now since uh, since few months. As far as uh, the general uh, uh, market, uh, stock markets doing, this is something we look closely because uh, this can be an effect on the perceived wealth of people. So far, we have not seen uh, um, direct, uh, uh, a direct impact of it uh, on, uh, on sales because uh, our sales to 
local customers around the world has kept being positive, very positive also in the third quarter. But of course, it's something that we look closely because we know that it may have an effect right. on luxury consumption. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. We'll move next to Brian Nagel at Oppenheimer. Good morning. I appreciate you taking my questions. So I also want to uh, just dive maybe a little bit deeper into the issue of um, spending a part of Chinese tourists. Could you help us do the math, maybe for Mark, uh, on just what weaker sales to Chinese tourists, how, how, what, how large that impact was to your, to your total company uh, comps? And then the second question, I guess this is maybe a follow-up to what Paul was asking initially, but is, is Tiffany just really at the mercy of, of these currency shifts, or are there actions you can take to help offset the impacts in your business? Yeah, I think uh, maybe I'll start and then Alex can provide additional uh, commentary. Um, you know, clearly, uh, if you look at our business and you say, well, what was different in the first and second quarters relative to the third, um, there's not a lot to point to specifically outside of some of these macro factors that we're now contending with. Um, you know, Alex, in his prepared remarks, said very clearly that unit volume growth was strong throughout, you know, the quarters uh, with domestics. Uh, we talked about domestic sales uh, being strong pretty much in all regions and all product categories. Uh, for you know the first, second, and third quarters of the year, and so with strong you know product, uh, with a store that is you know improving each and every day, uh, with you know a strong communicating uh, you know and, and higher share of voice, uh, you know brand message, um, I think you could then you know in some ways answer your own question uh, that clearly you know the tourism impact that we did see in the third quarter was. Uh, you know, one of the you know largest delineating factors between the you know sales results we posted in the first half of the year versus the third quarter trends. Uh, you know, we look mm -hmm. at Chinese tourist travel very closely with market by market. Um, you know, we have a very strong business with with the mainland uh, you know domestic Chinese, uh, but we also look at you know Hong Kong and Macau, and we look at you know global tourism flows and patterns. And we do know that you know the Chinese tourists, uh, not surprisingly, as for all global luxury players, uh, they are an important part you know of the equation uh, today and going forward. Um, you know, we believe that we have strong programs and plans that speak directly to them, and we think the evidence of that is clearly shown in our mainland domestic results in the third quarter, which, as we said, were even stronger than the first half of the year. Yeah, and uh, I would add to that that, I mean, uh, let's take uh, an example, a practical example. If we take Hong Kong, Hong Kong uh, government issued some uh, statistics recently about uh, Chinese tourist arrivals in Hong Kong. And uh, for the first uh, eight months of the year, the increase of Chinese arrivals was uh, ranging between plus 10 and plus 20 percent, depending on the month. And uh, in September, uh, it went down to a very low single digit. Now, you can imagine that our uh, people, our organization in Hong Kong, uh, there is little that can do for, uh, to compensate this. Of course, we have uh, marketing that is uh, uh, really focused to uh, tourists. But, of course, it depends a lot. Its uh, effectiveness depends a lot on the number of tourists that uh, come to a, a single place. So to answer to your question, what uh, is important for me is uh, to keep uh, the relevance of the brand uh, with uh, Chinese customers in general, because we know this is a huge uh, engine of growth and is a, an important portion of our business. And this is why I'm so pleased about uh, the launch of paper flowers in China that has been uh, really amazing. The sales uh, in, to Chinese in mainland China accelerating. This is a sign of the fundamental health and appeal of the brand to Chinese customers. Then, unfortunately, when it comes to, to travel patterns, this is something that we have seen it, the entire industry has seen it several times in the past, um, changing suddenly one quarter to another in one way and another, and this is uh, only very marginally uh, influenced by our actions. Yeah. Travel patterns, currency moves, regulations, all of that. Okay. Very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank next. you. We'll go next to Michael Benetti at Credit Suisse. Hey guys, um, thanks for taking our questions here. Um, 
I know, I know you don't want to get into too much detail in 2019 today, but I, I think the burning question really is, is you, did you think about the framework that you've already spoken to to help guide us over a multi-year path here? I think you commented that this year would be the SG&A reset year for the algorithm with very low EPS growth on the same mid-single digit comp, but next year we'll be back to a more normalized algorithm with margin leverage. But you signed up for some very long-dated investments here that are no doubt the right thing to do for the business over the long term. But if if we are in for a period of extended uh, subdued tourism trends, how much flexibility do you have with the investment schedule next year to manage SG&A inflation in, in that kind of a global consumer scenario? Well, I think, uh, you know, we want to take things one one step at a time. You know, I don't think it's appropriate just to say too much about 2019 other than the, the fact that, you know, we have stated very publicly that we do expect to have operating margin expansion in 2019. Uh, you're right. You know, this has been kind of earmarked as a bit of an investment year across the five key areas that we identified where we had, um, you know, lagged and, and hadn't made sufficient investments in prior years to really drive sustainable top-line sales growth. Some of those elements, you're right, will, you know, continue to roll forward uh, to some extent. So, for example, you know, you think about IT systems. Um, you know, we are now standing up, you know, multiple geographies simultaneously. And if you look back to the first quarter of this year, we stood up China. Um, so you could argue that there'll be more IT spending, um, you know, in maybe the first quarter of 19 relative to the first quarter of, of 18, and that might be a fair assessment. Uh, we're continuing to roll out our, you know, our, our CVM, uh, you know, elements into the stores. And we've done a lot of that in the current year, but that will continue into next year. So there will be, you know, some areas that, you know, you know, carry forward in effect as it relates to that. Uh, but we have very clearly stated that we expect to uh, drive operating margin expansion in 2019 um, and are committed to that. And we certainly built, you know, plans internally to, to allow for that as well. We're doing that by getting really aggressive on the procurement side um, and a lot of the other work takeouts that we have been affecting, you know, here corporately as a, as a team. Okay, and then um, I guess you you would you would have that same confidence if you know away from your control we we are in you know a bit of a if the if the same sort of sales trajectory comes in at the low end of what you guys think about historically you feel like you have ample flexibility to to continue that commitment on the operating line next year. I guess what I would say is we have said very clearly that we need to be able to extract you know um, you know P and L leverage at a lower rate of overall sales growth. Um, and we are putting programs and processes in place to uh, allow for that. Now, you know, obviously we'd like to see, you know, more top lines as opposed to less. That makes things, you know, considerably easier. Um, and we can't be too predictive of where things will be, you know, a quarter from now you know, with respect to, you know, Chinese, you know, tourism. What I can tell you is that we feel very good about the long-term trends. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've talked often about is the fact that, you know, when you do look at, you know, tourism, people tend to spend more when they are traveling, when they are on holiday, uh, you know, we've had these types of shifts before where, um, you know, certain key, you know, groups uh, like the Chinese might be traveling more heavily to Japan one quarter and then maybe to the U.S. the next and Europe the one thereafter. Those things we can't control. But as Alex said, if we have the right messages tailored to the Chinese themselves and they find the brand appealing, you know, that provides some real ballast there. If you also think about just long-term trends, I think the estimate right now is that only, what, 6, 7, 8 percent of total Chinese even have a passport, right? So the long-term trend of, of the Chinese who are... Uh, you know, uh, you know, having an, an emergence of their, their middle class and their high net worth folks. Uh, there's going to be more and more Chinese traveling the world, which is a good thing for all of us. Um, and we welcome that, um, and we think that they will continue to frequent our stores when they make those purchase occasions. All right, thanks for all the help. I really appreciate it, Mark. We'll move next to David Schiff with Consumer Ads Research. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I think that one of the things that's been so interesting to uh, all of uh, the observers on the street is, is your connectivity with the consumer in different ways, whether it's product, the stores, you know, new product, the stores, um, and, and the marketing. Uh, you know, I guess sales move around, as you said, and, and you want to build the model for the long term, but could you talk about markers, whether it's you know, in your CRM, in your interactions that give you the confidence that those newness pathways are going to mean more than just the latest change in sales direction. What I'm trying to say is, you know, whether it's what you're hearing at the store level around engagement, I know that moved around a little bit this quarter, or, you know, customers asking about new gift catalogs, just a little more, I think, anecdote uh, around your relationship with customers and what that could mean over time. 
Well, thank you, David, because I think this question is really the core uh, uh, matter that, um, that we are focusing on, which is uh, we have taken, we have started taking a lot of actions uh, in, uh, in the past uh, uh, quarters uh, in uh, modernizing our marketing, innovating products, etc., etc. So as management, uh, our, my constant uh, uh, obsession really is to see day by day how these things impact uh, on the fundamentals of our business. And uh, there are several things that are really encouraging us and are clearing from certain uh, concerns that at the beginning I, uh, I could have. And let me make uh, a few examples. First of all, we have seen uh, in the last uh, uh, nine months uh, an increase, uh, a substantial increase in traffic, uh, both in our uh, stores, physical stores, as well as our uh, um, websites. We have seen uh, um, conversion rate uh, increasing in the first part of the year as well as in the, in the last uh, quarter. Now, difficult to say if this is uh, directly related to the activities that we have done in the stores, but for example, we have uh, enhanced our visual merchandising in the United States uh, and the conversion rate that was growing in the first two quarters after this uh, enhancement uh, has grown at an even faster pace. Now, is it totally due to the enhanced visual merchandising? I mean, nobody knows, but for example, talking, I've been to several stores uh, in the U.S. after this new VM uh, uh, project, and our teams were, uh, were enthusiastic. They were reporting of customers saying, oh, what did you do to this store? It's new, et cetera. Well, in reality, it was uh, simply a new visual merchandising. But let me make uh, some, uh, some more uh, examples. Uh, what I constantly look at is... Uh, what's happening to our sales uh, between uh, existing customers and new customers because you know that we have quite radically changed our communication in the past year and uh, so this was an area of concern for me to monitor is it working or it's not working and i'm very pleased because constantly including the last uh, quarter we have seen an increase in sales both to new customers as well as uh, an increase uh, to existing customers. So this, uh, to me, shows two things. One is that uh, the new messaging of the brand is uh, resonating with uh, new customers, but is not alienating existing customers. Now, this growth uh, to existing customers uh, is due more to the new communication or is due more to the enhanced uh, CRM we have that I'm not able to tell you. But what I can see is that the fundamentals of the business, that at the end of the day is uh, local customers, uh, traffic, uh, conversion rate, uh, they are all positive uh, throughout uh, uh, the, the geographies. And uh, even if we have uh, uh, had a slowdown to a mid-single digit growth uh, in, um, in the third quarter, when we look at the products, I didn't see there is not uh, a product-related uh, pattern. The pattern that we have uh, uh, seen is more geography and tourism flow related. So all this uh, is, of course, we, uh, we were more pleased with double-digit growth than with single-digit growth, but when it comes to the fundamentals, we are really encouraged by the actions we are taking. Thanks very much. We'll move next to Oliver Chen at Cowan and Company. Hi, what are your excuse me? What are your thoughts about the the duration of the uh, of the Chinese consumer and and your own plans? And what what happened with the product assortment in terms of the the composition of of products and what that may mean for how you should should plan globally? Um, and just Related to that is your thoughts on if this is a, a continued shift um, as more people uh, consume, you know, do domestically in mainland China, and, and where you think, how long you think that will go on for, and how we should characterize this a uh, shift versus um, a reduction in spending or some combination of both. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, for uh, for your question. Well. 
Difficult to tell for us uh, how long this will last. Uh, I mean, here we get into macroeconomic uh, speculations that uh, we are not the best people to, to answer to this. It's uh, obviously the fact that uh, um, the tariffs uh, uh, in China have uh, decreased, uh, the fact that the Chinese government has declared that they want to enhance and push the local consumptions. These uh, are all factors that uh, affect uh, any retail business, including, including ours. This is uh, unfortunately outside of our control, and, uh, and it's impossible for me to, to preview uh, how long this will, um, will last. On the other side, what we can do, and we have uh, been doing and we started doing, is that following the, the flows of uh, Chinese uh, customers, and now having them spending more in mainland China rather than uh, abroad, of course, we are making adjustments uh, to our inventory in order to make sure that we are not missing any sale in uh, mainland China where the demand now is really very, very strong. So operationally, we are doing a lot in order to follow or try to follow um, where customers uh, are uh, buying with, uh, with the best possible offer. And uh, so far uh, in uh, mainland China, this is paying back. Okay, and lastly, digital engagement has been um, really improving and a lot more exciting. What are the features that you are planning ahead, and where do you think the biggest opportunities are? Um, and the digital will manifest in, um, in both inventory as well as features as well as engagement. Just would love your, your thoughts on, on what that will, uh, how that will evolve and what it means for luxury. Thank you. Well, our uh, e-commerce uh, sales, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, 13, uh, 13. 13 uh, uh, countries mm -hmm. where we operate our direct uh, e-commerce, uh, and uh, uh, the, the sales growth uh, in this channel has been uh, a strong double digit here to date uh, and uh, is uh, exact in line uh, also in, in the third quarter, mm -hmm. even slightly higher. So we are uh, pleased with this because it shows that uh, the investments we are making in, uh, in the e-commerce to improve our platforms, our assets, and our offer there um, are paying back, and the growth is much higher than in the brick and, in the brick and mortar. Of course, I mean, we are just uh, at the beginning of a journey. We, uh, I keep on repeating this because, uh, I mean, we've been working very hard in the last three quarters, but... Uh, I think we have years in front of us, and uh, when it comes specifically to e-commerce, uh, we are working very hard now for major improvements uh, next year and in the years uh, to come. Right. So this is not something, this like anything else, is not something that is fixed uh, in, a, in a couple of quarter, or quarters, but I can tell you this is, we take very seriously the e-commerce opportunity in um, Western countries as well as uh, in Asia, and we are investing in it in order to further grow our performance uh, of the last three quarters. Happy holidays, thanks. Thank you. We'll go next to Erwin Ramborg at HSBC. Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Um, thanks a lot for taking my question. Sorry to belabor the point around Chinese tourism flows, but um, when you speak to your uh, teams, in the different markets, um, can you assess what you believe is down to psychology, i.e., uh, what was asked around uh, equity markets and you know potentially tariffs and trade or other elements of stress that could impact consumer confidence, and and what is more linked to FX, i.e., is it just that um, when your wealth is in renminbi, basically the world looks pretty expensive to you? Um, so can, can you split what you think is linked to psychology of Chinese consumption versus just FX matters? And then related to that, how does that impact the U.S., i.e., uh, the local U.S. consumer seems to be doing really well. Uh, Chinese flows um, here into the U.S. Um, seem to be affected. What, what is the case for, you know, what's the split between the two? And are you seeing anything different from other nationality of tourism, um, i.e., is every uh, nationality impacted by the strength of the dollar, or are you seeing certain nationalities do well into the U.S.? Thank you. Thank you, Erwan. Um, well, if we let's look at li a little bit at our at our com sales, uh, uh, there, and I would look at it at, at constant exchange rates because this is more meaningful business-wise. So mm -hmm. here to date, uh, we are uh, growing com sales at six percent. 
and in the quarter is uh, a plus three percent globally. Now, in, um, in the Americas, uh, the growth uh, went from seven year to date to five year to date. Now, uh, this uh, uh, to five uh, in the quarter. Now, yeah. this uh, we mainly attribute it to uh, Chinese uh, general foreign spending, but I would say mainly Chinese spending. Because if I look at sales to domestic local customers in North America, we have seen uh, a very solid growth in the first two quarters and exactly the same growth also in the third quarter. Now, uh, you are asking me about uh, the, the, um, the stock market's influence. Now, it's true that uh, two quarters, I mean, six months ago, nobody was talking about uh, technology um, share prices uh, uh, being weak, and this is something that uh, has happened more recently, so I'm not able to tell you about the future. But uh, as far as uh, the, um, the year to date and the third quarter, we have seen uh, no um, slowdown in demand from uh, local customers in, uh, in USA. Where uh, there has been a slowdown uh, is clearly in Japan, because if you look at uh, com sales, uh, they go from 6% here to date to 2% quarter, last quarter. And, uh, and this is uh, due both to Chinese tourists, but also to a softer demand in Japan, and uh, where sales to uh, local customers uh, have been soft in the last quarter. But this, I mean, I don't like, I mean, you never hear me talking about uh, the weather and this kind of things, but we have to admit that there was an earthquake in, uh, in, uh, in Japan that affected, uh, of course, uh, a lot of uh, consumptions. And, uh, Honestly, I don't see any problem of the brand with Japanese consumers. We have a very strong leadership position there. There is no matter of uh, lack of confidence or uh, change of, uh, of something. So um, I would say uh, the, what is really meaningful in a nutshell for me is that uh, sales to local customers in the third quarter have remained uh, strong. Let's, uh, let's hope that this uh, trend uh, continues or even <laughs> improves uh, going forward. But you know that uh, in, uh, in our business, uh, this is a very special moment because uh, we are uh, now in November and you know that uh, December, the single month of December is uh, more than uh, enough of our last quarter. So naturally, the games uh, are, are open. Everything will happen in the, in the yeah. four weeks uh, that are in front of us. And uh, I think that internally we have put down all the actions in terms of products, marketing, training, CRM that we could do. Now really everything is in the hands uh, of customers and uh, their uh, propension to buy. And we hope that they will be good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Best you. of luck. Thanks. We'll move next to Francesca De Pasquantonio of Deutsche Bank. Uh, yes, hi, good afternoon. I have um, three uh, follow-up questions, please. Uh, the first one is regarding uh, your uh, global footprint of stores, whether you feel it is uh, adequate uh, or somehow it's not uh, allowing you to express your full potential. Um, in terms uh, of capturing uh, the, the, the traffic and the demand uh, in the different regions, uh, especially by the, the Chinese tourists traveling around. The second question is on uh, following up on what you just said on, on December. Um, would it be, you know, a good, uh, let's say, um, a good... Uh, uh, description to say that uh, you are uh, feeling good about the forthcoming holiday season, given what we have seen in terms of the strength of the U.S. consumer recently. And the third question is on diamond prices. I know it doesn't uh, affect you, um, but, you know, the beers lowering, uh, the, the selling prices, uh, uh, the, the prices for their lower quality diamonds, uh, how do you see this um, and do you see it as a signal for 
uh, you know, future trends in diamond prices? Uh, how do you feel about, you know, the idea of diamond as a store of value on one hand and the beers, um, you know, signaling um, um, something else? Many, many, many thanks. Ciao Francesca, thank you for, uh, for your questions. So, so first of all, about the store network. I think we have uh, a very, a very strong uh, store, store network. It's uh, covering, it's truly global. And uh, if we think specifically to the latest trend of this uh, increasing uh, demand in mainland China, even in mainland China, we have a network that is really comparable with our best competitors, and it's a network where we have been investing a lot. If you think even this year, we have, um, we have opened uh, new stores in, uh, in China, in Suzhou, in Changsha, in Hefei. We had two relocations, one in Nanjing, one in Xi'an. So we are investing uh, in, uh, in the network, not only in China, but uh, particularly in China, and we will keep doing so in the future where we have uh, plans uh, of uh, enhancing our store network uh, in China and uh, uh, elsewhere for, for next year. So honestly, I see that as a strength of the brand, not, uh, not as a weakness. Now, if you ask me, there are opportunities for Tiffany to open uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 stores. Uh, yes, but we tend to be more conservative about this in the sense that we are really focusing on the eff efficiency and productivity of existing stores. Uh, we are more really working on the like for like rather than taking the easy way of just adding additional stores. That is a nice thing, it is a reserve that we have there and we will in due time uh, uh, exploit it, but this is not really our main focus that is more on productivity. Yeah, the, the long term plan is still to grow global square footage about 2% a year. Okay. When Thank it you. comes uh, to your second question about uh, my feeling about uh, the next uh, four or five weeks, uh, well, honestly, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's something that uh, in general we don't uh, uh, comment on the current business, uh, even less so on, on the future. And, uh, and honestly, uh, I think it's a little bit difficult for anybody in the world to have, uh, to have this answer. So I'm really not able to, to comment uh, on this. Right. And then relative to the third question about diamond prices and what De Beers recently did, um, you know, that was, on, that was on low end quality stones. I really don't think that has any bearing on, on what we purchase and what we buy. Um, you know, we've talked about the fact that, you know, we basically, you know, reject, you know, 99.96% of the world's, you know, gem quality stones. And you, know, you talked about, you know, diamonds as a store of value and, and whether or not this will be impeded or affected by this. I think the answer is clearly, clearly no. I mean, it's, think about, like, you know, high-end classic luxury cars. You know, those hold their, their value. They're, they're an asset class into themselves. You buy a, a lower-end car, it's a depreciating, wasting asset. Uh, I think the types of diamonds that we, we deal in and, and the diamonds that we, you know, uh, provide our customers are of such high quality that they will always be a store of value and they will always appreciate going forward as a general rule. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Simeon Siegel at Nomura Instanet. Hi, this is Dan Stroller on for Simeon. Thanks for taking our question. Uh, Mark, um, can you quantify how much of the gross margin expansion was due to uh, fewer wholesale sales of diamonds? And then just any thoughts going forward on the use of those sales? Thank you. Yeah, that's not something that we would uh, we would typically break out specifically. What I will tell you is that um, you know, we have been, you know, working really hard to ensure that, um, you know, we uncover every rock as it relates to cost savings opportunities. So we've talked about our procurement function a little bit in the past and how it's a relatively recent construct. It was only begun a couple years back. Um, but just by way of an example, you know, we, we currently have a, a portfolio, a project portfolio in the procurement team that is of over 300 projects. And we have dedicated groups that are looking at uh, we need to have cost takeout across, you know, design and construction, information technology, uh, strategic sourcing team, a corporate services team. Uh, we have teams dedicated towards marketing and, and design and construction, as well as packaging. Um, IT contracts is a specific area that we have dedicated groups against as well. And so maybe just, you know, for the, for the purposes of an example, I can kind of point out one thing that was just recently done. This is a project that started in September. It was completed in October of this year. And we basically took 18 uh, credit card processing providers, 18 that we had used across the EMEA region. This was across 11 different countries. 
And we put in place, you know, an RFP process um, where we worked with the business to understand exactly what the requirements were, and we were able to go from 18 providers across EMEA for credit card processing down to one. Um, you know, we did that in a way where we can now have more customer payment forms accepted, like Alipay and you know, WeChat, uh, which again makes it more consumer friendly. Um, and in doing so, we also reduced the cost that we were paying for the credit card processing fees, you know, by over 40%, as an example. So, uh, you know, gross margin. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. You know, we don't want to get too specific or too granular on teasing out any one given element. Um, but I can assure you that you know the cost takeout programs that we have across the company are. Uh, pervasive and, and, and becoming more and more so each and every day. Got it. Thank you. We'll go next to Brian Tunick at Royal Bank of Canada. Great. Uh, thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, curious, maybe, Alex, you could talk about sort of how you feel about product innovation, pipeline, and uh, maybe some more details on the product categories. Um, you know, specifically you head into 2019, sort of how do you think, you know, Tiffany looks position-wise from product newness, um, you know, any big ideas versus maybe previously before you joined the company? And, and second question, just maybe on Europe, maybe give some more color on the improvement there and if you think the worst is behind the company or from a macro perspective um, in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> well, in uh, this year, in 2018, we started accelerating product innovation. It, this was uh, the beginning of our program. It happened with uh, paper flowers. The results so far are encouraging, and especially there is an hour effect on the entire uh, um, platinum, gold, and diamond jewelry that is, uh, that is very positive, so we are pleased with it. Difficult to say on Tiffany True. It's a pre-launch now since a few weeks uh, in North America. Anecdotally, uh, our uh, uh, salespeople are very enthusiastic about it, but you know it's early to say about uh, uh, the total results. But definitely, we have uh, um, we have a strong pipeline for innovation for for next year. And uh, you have to understand that uh, this is a process I started when I joined uh, 14 months ago, and uh, the lead time for product development it takes uh, one and a half year normally. So we have uh, yes, we have uh, very solid plans for next year. We are confident uh, on what internally we are doing about it, and um, and so far the results uh, are, are positive, and we see it from as I said traffic conversion rate and growth in uh, existing and new customers uh, with uh, uh, domestic customers everywhere. And maybe some more color about Europe trends and thoughts? Well, about uh, Europe, also there, what we said about Chinese customers uh, uh, buying less abroad is valid also also in uh, in Europe, and uh, we have uh, also there very strong uh, programs for, for the holiday. We have an amazing <laughs> initiative in uh, in uh, in the UK in London. We have the pop-up store there in uh, in Covent Garden that uh, has had an enormous uh, um, coverage in terms of press and enormous traffic. We have uh, an initiative in uh, with our uh, partners in perfume in um, in St Pancras Station. I received hundreds of pictures of <laughs> friends and uh, of the house about that amazing installation. So let me say we the teams have been working very hard in order to really get the most out of local customers. Next question. Next, Next we'll move to Laurent Vasilescu at Macquarie. Good morning, and thanks for taking my question. I wanted to follow up on, on Greater China. I think the 10K parses out that it's approximately 60% of 2017 Asia-Pacific revenues, which I think equates to 16% of total company revenues. Can you parse out how much the Chinese consumer represents of overall total company sales if we include their shopping uh, um, in other regions? Is it fair to say 25%? And then can you maybe quantify if Greater China grew overall this quarter if we include Hong Kong and Macau? Well, when uh, uh, we take uh, uh, luxury brands, and there are many studies that are public about this, uh, typically around uh, one-third of uh, the total business uh, nowadays uh, is made with Chinese nationals. And, uh, and typically the split is uh, of this 33%. 
one third uh, um, in, uh, is made in mainland China and two thirds uh, is made up of uh, Chinese national spending abroad. Now, these are uh, industry uh, general data. As uh, Tiffany, we are uh, more or less uh, in, that, uh, in, that range, uh, in that range as well. So um, this, uh, this explains also uh, the concerns we have about uh, uh, Chinese uh, travelers because it's an important portion of our business. And on the other side, explains why we are satisfied with the growth in mainland China because that is the real, the real engine of, uh, of growth. Okay, very helpful. Thank you very much. And then as a quick follow-up, year-to-date, the free cash flow is slightly down. Uh, to get to the $300 million in free cash flow for the year, Mark, maybe can you walk us through the fourth quarter cash from operations to get to the full-year guide? Yeah, what I would tell you is that uh, you know, we modified our language just a little bit as it relates to free cash flow. The, the short answer in the interest of time is that it relates to uh, tax payments. Um, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of uh, moving parts on, on the corporate tax law changes and the, uh, the tax payments will be what drives the slight differential in our free cash flow guidance. Okay, very helpful. Thank you very much. We'll move next to Bob Drupal at Guggenheim Security. Hi, guys. Um, good morning. I was just wondering if you could talk you know, to the, the Blue Book event, you know, how that was received you know, generally, and if you did anything different this year versus last year. And just an update on the investment you are making in the high-end jewelry and, and sort of, you know, where we are in, in that uh, initiative as well. Thank you. Thanks, Bob, because uh, that is an important initiative, and, uh, and, and uh, we haven't had the opportunity to expand on that. Well, this, you know that every year we have two major uh, high jewelry events, one in the first semester and the second one in the second semester in addition to uh, more regular activities that we do on iJuare. This year, uh, the, um, New York, the event that we held in New York, that we call it Blue Book, was held in the second part uh, of, the, of the year, actually in October, while last year uh, was in the first part uh, of, uh, of the year. But uh, um, still there were uh, two events uh, in the two uh, parts of the year, both last year and this year. Now, the difference uh, is uh, about uh, this blue book where there were two major differences. One is that uh, we have a new chief artistic officer, so this is why we decided to have the New York event uh, in the fall instead of uh, the spring, in order to allow him to have uh, more time to, with his team uh, to uh, design uh, these amazing pieces. And uh, the second thing is that, uh, as we announced a couple of uh, quarters ago, we have invested more in uh, more important uh, zones that, of course, go in this uh, age jewelry. And so in this Blue Book event, uh, there were more important uh, uh, pieces of stones than uh, normally. I have to say that the reaction of customers has been very, very positive to both factors, both the design innovation brought by uh, Reed and his team, as well as uh, by the extremely I would say the exceptional stones that we offered the, to, to our customers that were very, very well received. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go next to Dana Telsey at Telsey Advisory. Hi. Good, good morning, everyone. As you think about the collections, the category um, performance in jewelry, engagement, and designer jewelry, how does it break out between the regions? Is there anything you saw differently, particularly relative to the change in performance and designer jewelry? Thank you. Overall, uh, uh, looking at, um, at uh, product performance by category and uh, even uh, at a more granular level than by collections, etc., there was not uh, a change in pattern between uh, the third quarter and uh, uh, the first uh, uh, part of the year. Uh, the only exception is uh, about uh, uh, designers, uh, uh, specifically Peretti, uh, that uh, were, there were several factors. Probably the most relevant one is that uh, the Peretti uh, collection is uh, um, traditionally very strong in Japan, and Japan has been uh, uh, more affected because of the reasons that we said uh, in this uh, last quarter. But apart from this, uh, this detail, uh, I would say really no product-related uh, 
changes in, uh, in uh, performance. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go next to Laura Champlain at Loop Capital. Thanks and good morning. In your 10Q today, you spelled out that over the next three years, you'll see about 10 to 15 cents of pressure each year on EPS from the New York flagship remodeling. Can you put that in context uh, by telling us about how much pressure you'll see from the remodelings in the chain overall globally over the next three years? I guess what I would say is uh, I'd offer two things. One, just to provide additional clarity on what we said about the flagship project. We did say that it would be about 10 to 15 cents um, of cost uh, during the you know, construction you know, build out in effect. We did say that about seven cents of that would be already absorbed and incurred in the current fiscal year. And so the year over year differential would be another call at seven, eight cents, you know, incrementally year versus year. Um, you know, as far as the other question is concerned, you know, we've been uh, building out our store network um, you know, over the last many years, and the amount of capex we plan to spend um, going into uh, 19, and the amount of money that we spent in, in 18 uh, for the base store network will be comparable to what we spent in effect in in, in 16 um, in, in the prior year. So I wouldn't expect there to be a meaningful change um, in our in our in our burn rate or our cost as it relates to the underlying store network. And then, of course, the flagship does come on top, uh, but that's what spoke to that 10 to 15 cents. Got it. Thank you. We'll go next to Alexandra Walvis at Goldman Sachs. Great. Thank you so much for taking the question. Um, I was wondering if we could reflect for a moment on um, some of the new launches in the last year, in particular everyday objects and paper flowers. Um, a year into you know, that process of some of these new collections. Um, I was wondering if there's anything that had surprised you in terms of the shape of demand following the launches. You know, for example, was the initial pop in demand higher than expectations and how persistent has demand for those product areas been since the initial launch? Um, and then I suppose finally um, have the, the trends that you've observed in that respect changed the way at all that you think about how um, you're introducing newness into the into the collection in the future. Thank you, Alexandra, for uh, for your question. Well, we are very pleased actually with the performance of uh, home uh, and um, and accessories as well as paper flowers. Uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's in line with our expectations. You have to understand that in uh, in our business in jewelry, newness is important, but it's not. Uh, is extremely important when it comes to messaging, to driving traffic, is not so radical when it comes to sales in the sense that differently from fashion when you have a new collection that can represent uh, 20, 30, 40, uh, 50 or even more percent of your sales, this is absolutely not the case in jewelry where uh, the strength of uh, every brand are the pillars of uh, um, iconic designs that remain uh, uh, successful for decades. And this is the case of Tiffany with T, with uh, Peretti, with uh, hardware, with keys, uh, as it is uh, for the best uh, jewelers in the world. So overall, uh, we, are, uh, we are pleased. And uh, I think that uh, we wouldn't have had uh, um, an increased traffic uh, uh, in our stores uh, if our launches were not uh, well received. Uh, people would have not come to the stores. Then they come to the store and uh, some buy new products, but uh, most of customers tend to buy iconic uh, existing products, which makes us uh, very happy. Also because this uh, allows uh, efficiencies uh, when it comes, uh, for example, to manufacturing, to the gross margin. I mean, uh, we didn't talk so much about gross margin uh, uh, until now in this call, but this is something that has improved uh, in, um, in the year and in the quarter, and I think is a sign of, healthy, uh, of an healthy business uh, and of also efficiencies uh, on the manufacturing point of view, which, uh, of which we are very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, operator. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, it's now 9.30, so I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. And that does conclude today's conference. Again, thank you for your participation.